Today I'm going to try something different, which is to try to do double-sided milling, where the final thickness is very, very close to the thickness of the material. So this will require a few changes from what I've done in the past. I'm in front of my lathe, and my lathe has some brackets that I made for the Z-axis stepper motor that I use for the electronic lead screw project, which is right there. And I always wanted to replace them with metal brackets. When I first designed these brackets, I designed them to be made out of material that I have readily available because it's the material that I use for making molds. So the material is very slightly thicker than the actual brackets. So what I want to try is see if I can flip the part over and re-indicate once I've flipped it over to see if I can do two-sided milling without the usual technique. The usual technique is to have a hat that you mill off as the second part. Basically the hat is what holds it in place for up one. You flip it over and then you've got some thickness of material that you use to hold it in place and then you mill that off. And the idea of doing that is during the first operation, you can mill to the full depth of the outer perimeter. But this time I'm going to see if I can mill down only part way, flip it over, and then mill it the rest of the way, and see if I can get it to match up well enough. So let's head to the computer and I'll show you what I'm going to work on. This is the stepper motor mount that I designed previously for my Emco lathe. This is for an electronic lead screw, and you can see it's a fairly straightforward mount. We just have these two pieces here, and the idea of that is that if you see here, there's a curved slot. This can pivot around this point, and I can use that to tension the belt. When I first designed this, I had in mind making that these out of aluminum, and I have aluminum that's typically half an inch thick by 2.5 inches wide, which is what I use to make the blanks for a lot of my injection molds. So I wanted to make this out of that material. You can see this side is fine. It's a little bit thinner than half an inch. But if we look at this side here, select from there to there, you can see it's a little bit over half an inch. So the first thing that I needed to do is to change the thicknesses of these parts to try to make sure that the geometry was the same because this can't move. It's controlled by the geometry of the machine itself. And so I came up with this. And you can see it looks very much the same, but the difference is this is now 0.48 inches. That's a little bit less than half an inch so that I can use a two inch diameter face mill to face off the top and the bottom to give it a very smooth finish. This is also the same exact width. To be able to do that, I had to switch from using spacers that are built into the part to using washers that will go between here. And I had to make a few other changes as well, such as I had to push the pulley closer to the stepper motor because this distance from there to there is thinner. And what that meant is that I needed to add a hole here for the shaft of the stepper motor because now the stepper motor was actually closer to the back surface here than it was before. I 3D printed this mount with PLA. This was intended to be temporary, and you can see it, it's not as rigid as I'd like it to be. I'm certainly hoping, hoping that the aluminum version is going to be a lot more rigid. Anyway, let's uh, go ahead and uh, remake these in aluminum. This is the part that I want to mill. And because of these different shapes here, it's something that's difficult to mill with a single side. So the usual way of doing this is to start with material that's, say, 0.1 inches thicker, leaving a top on it, which is going to be the part that's held in the vise here. So basically the idea is that you can mill all the way down to here in the first operation, and then flip it over, and then mill off the hat, and then mill the rest of the interior of the part. I want to try a different approach, which I think is going to be more efficient use of the material. And that is to have stock that's only slightly larger than the part. So if we look at the cross section here, you can see that we have a little bit of extra stock on the top and the bottom. This is ten thousandths of an inch here, as well as there. And that's basically enough so that I can come in with my tri-fly 
and surface this and get a beautiful surface finish on the top and then the bottom. So the first orientation is like this, where the back left is going to be touching this surface and this surface, as well as the bottom here to leave some room for the second operation. Now that means I want to make sure that I have a known surface here and a known surface there for the first operation, which I then probe to make sure that I know exactly where that is. Because what I'm going to want to do is when I flip it over like this, I'm going to probe the same two surfaces, but on the opposite or the bottom, what used to be the bottom side and, and is now the top. Using the same two surfaces here gives me the best possible alignment. So the belief that I have, which I'm going to test, is that this will allow me to have a step between basically the surfaces here down to the surface and from there down. So the step between those is less than one thousandth of an inch. That's what I'm hoping to achieve. So let's head to the machine and see if I actually achieve that. The idea that I had is I would start with one side, which is going to be against the fixed side of the vise, cleaned up so that it was a known and smooth location. And then I also wanted to have the left side also cleaned up so it was smooth and a known location. Here I'm using the tri-fly, as I mentioned earlier, to remove the top ten thousandths of an inch from the material to produce a beautiful surface finish. Next it's using the adaptive machining to remove the, most of the material. So this is going to mill it down to the part way point that I showed earlier, which is a little bit uh, past where the flat side is going to be on the bottom, which will eventually become the top when I flip this over. And now you can see here I'm doing the final pass to produce the smooth surface on this. And it's not going to go all the way to the back end because that should be the finished surface there. But you can see it does go all the way around. I really enjoy watching the spot drill make these depressions that will ensure that the drill doesn't wander as it drills each of these holes that it's marking out. There's also something mesmerizing about watching it drill. I, I don't know what it is, but I do enjoy watching it uh, peck drill. Peck drilling is where it's going down a little bit each time and then backing up ever so slightly to break the chip so that you don't end up with a long stringy chip. None of these holes that I'm boring out have a precision size. And so what I'm doing is I'm using an end mill that's smaller than I need the hole to be, and then I'm just using a boring cycle. For example, this hole is going to be tapped for M5. The usual way is to put in a drill of the right size, but because I had this end mill already in the machine, it was faster and less work for me to just use that boring cycle rather than to put the drill in, set its length in the controller, etc and then a chamfer around the inside of all the holes and around the outside edge to break the edges and to also make it look nice. At this point, this side is done, so I can flip it end to end. So what was the back left is now the back right, which means I can then indicate the back right, and I should be picking up the exact same position, which means everything should be relative to that same back corner, which is now in the back right. So a bit of foreshadowing here. If you look at the edge facing the camera, you may notice that it's not finished. It's actually the bandsaw edge, and this will come back to bite me later. So I set the approximate position, and then I run the cycle, which picks up the exact position of that corner. And then it takes a while to rough out the side because there's quite a bit of aluminum that it needs to remove, but you can see it removes it nicely. And then we can do the final finishing passes, some boring for countersinks, and then the final chamfer. Here's the result, and the easiest way to tell whether or not there's a, a match in terms of the alignment of the top and bottom is to look at this chamfer here. And the reason it's useful to look at the chamfer here is because this was milled the hole from the other side, and then I milled the chamfer here. So let me zoom in on that. When I zoom in, you can clearly see that this is not even from one side to the other. So it's, let me use a pointer. So it's much less here 
and much stronger on this side, whereas from the front to back, it's about the same. So it's pretty clear there is a mismatch in the alignment. Now, this chamfer is, I believe, five thousandths of an inch. And so that means the alignment difference between these two sides is going to be less than that. I'm going to see if I can measure the difference in alignment, or at least that's what I believe. And we'll see what it actually is. If you look here, there, you can see there's an obvious step. And that step is along here as well, both sides. And if we look at the other side, there's a step there as well, but we have to look at it this way. And you can see that step is also quite obvious. If we look at it this way, additionally, you can see it's quite obvious here. So one of the things I'm curious about is to find out how much of a difference this is. So here's the setup I'm going to use to measure the depth or the difference in change between these two surfaces. And using my fingernail, I can tell that this right here is where it's deeper from this point perspective, and this is taller. So I'm going to move this over and then use the thumb screw to get a little bit of deviation on this indicator, which shows one ten thousandths of an inch per division. And then I'll be able to measure it. And I want to try to be able to have as much of the range as possible. So that's on four. Uh, and I want to move around, make sure everything looks good. You know, it's not changing very much, so the setup looks good. Now if I cross between the two, you can see it definitely goes up. It's not completely flat there, I'm not sure what that's about, but even if we average it out, this is roughly a six thousandths of an inch difference between this surface and this surface. The next question is, why is there so much of a difference between these two surfaces? With the experience I have with this machine, it seems like it should be a lot closer to this, and my personal tolerance for this device was within one thousandths. Clearly this is way outside of it, so the question is why? To figure out what went wrong, I went back and looked at the old footage. When I showed this before, I said that I had a known reference for the back and also the left side. But here, I'm actually dealing with the raw material. So this is just the band cut sawed material. And so I picked up that edge from rough material and then continued with the operations, which means it was not a reference edge. So I start over, this time I'm picking up the back left edge of the raw cut material, and then I'm cleaning it up with a pass here. And then after this pass, I just continued with all the other operations, including reprobing it on the back left, so that I was picking up the newly cleaned up surface. Here's the new version, and it still has a bit of a mismatch, which is, you can see here as a witness line, but if we look at the border, you know, straight on, you can't see a difference. So that means that it's a lot less this time. Uh, let's zoom into the center, which is where it's really obvious. So looking at the chamfer, we have the center. Again, this hole was milled from the other side, and then this chamfer was milled from this side. So the chamfer, if I got the alignment right, should be even all the way around. And it, from the eye, visually it looks even. So that means the mismatch that I have this time between the front and the back is quite small. It's most likely less than one thousandths of an inch, and it's probably even quite a bit less than that, which is really good. That's what I was hoping for. This is looking at the part that I just milled. You can see how much magnification I have, and there's no visible step between the two sides. If we look at this in the right way, let me try to see it here. You can see there is still a lip, but this lip is something that is quite significantly reduced from what I had before. And it's hard for me to figure out exactly how much. So let's set up the measuring again and see how much of a difference it is. I have the uh, part clamped to the one, two, three block and as square as I can get it. Feeling with my fingernail, it's hard to tell which of these is lower because I'm feeling a burr on both directions. So I'm just going to lower it on this side, which before was the, the low side, and try to get it on four. That's 
pretty close to four. Uh, and then I just want to make sure it's level. It's level there. So now if I go across, you can see that there's a little bit of a jump, um, but it's very close between the two. And I'm not sure what's causing the jump, but you can see that it's less than a thousandth of an inch. We're dealing with uh, ten thousandths of an inch here, so this is definitely within the tolerance that I was trying to shoot for. So I'm quite happy that this lip is very insignificant, and the chances are that when I do the finishing step, which is I want to put this in a vibratory tumbler, that I will see these marks disappear. They'll probably be buffed out by the tumbling process. So let's see what happens and I'll come back after I finish tumbling this. Here's some video at the end of milling the second part and everything was going along fine until right here in the chamfering when it started to gouge the material. And then I stopped it right here after I noticed that. Here's the next part finished, and I did make a mistake. You can see there's a gouge there and there. That's when the chamfer mill came along here and it came down too far. I guess I didn't have the diameter of the chamfer mill correct, so it gouged there and there. Now the good thing about that is this is actually going to be in like this, and the view is going to be from here, so it's probably not going to be that visible. So it's probably fine. Now, in terms of the alignment, there is again some misalignment here. I can feel a little bit, but it's not bad at all. And again, it's not gonna be really that visible on this part. Uh, if I were making a part where I really cared about it looking perfect, I wouldn't use this technique, but uh, for making parts that are close to the material thickness and don't have to be accurate to less than a thousandth of an inch. In other words, if there's a, a step that's you know slightly less than a thousandth of an, of an inch, which is the case here, then this technique works just fine. As long as you don't gouge it, but that's a different story. So the next thing I'm going to do is put this into the tumbler, get rid of all the uh, tooling marks, and then I'll come back and show you this after an hour or so in the tumbler. And then this is the finish after tumbling. Now this one is a little bit different from this that I'll explain in a little minute. But the thing that I really like about this finish is that it looks good. You don't see the tool marks. And more importantly, it's not that sensitive to fingerprints. So it will keep this appearance without me worrying about having it uh, look streaky, etc. So it seems like a stronger finish. Now to explain why this looks a little bit different, let me show you this. This is one that I did first and you can see that this finish is not very good at all. Now the reason that's the case is because I started out with this media here. This is the first one that I bought from Harbor Freight. They had two sizes. They had this size and then they had this size. And when I read about these, it said that these were not very aggressive. And so therefore, I figured that it would take a long time before we'd get rid of the tool mar tooling marks. And that was the case. It took about five hours. I actually tumbled this for about uh, two hours. I could still see tooling marks. And then I just left it in there for a while. And after a total of about five hours, this is what it looks like. Whereas with this, after half an hour or so, it had a lot of this look. But, you know, that's not a very nice look. So... I went back to the store, decided not to use these because these were too large. They also don't get into those areas very well. Whereas if we look at this one, where I started with the large one and then switched to the small media, you can see it did get in here a lot better. And again, this is the one that I did entirely with the small media, and it looks really good in the, the corners. So the lesson that I learned is that, at least for now, I'm going to use the, the small media. And I'll probably do some researching to find out if there are other media this size that have more aggressive behavior, because it does take a long time.
to get this finished. But again, this is a beautiful finish. I'm very happy with this. This is a time lapse of the disassembly. This is moving, I think, a total of uh, seven screws. All of these screws are M8. The first set allow me to remove the stepper tensioner, and then the second set removes the back bracket. As I mentioned before, I need to put M5 washers onto the back of this bracket to provide the correct spacing. And then it's just a matter of screwing this into the lathe itself with the screw holes that I previously drilled and tapped. So I eventually uh, got this off. What I hadn't uh, remembered is that there are actually two set screws in here. The inner set screws that are still in there, and then there were some outer set screws that locked the inner set screws in place. So that, of course, makes it much easier to uh, take it off. At this point, I can now put the plate back on, the new plate. So I think what I want is the wires in the back, like so. And then the plate is going to be, oh, and that would be a problem. So this plate is missing the, let me bring in the old one. And uh, you can see that the plate is uh, missing uh, the hole in the center. So I'm going to have to uh, add the hole in the center. I have lost my reference point, I think, or I might be able to pick it up from there, but um, it might e be just be easier to make a new one. Oops. Let's take a look at why I was missing that hole. So I'm going to find this component, which is this one, and then hide it. And you can see from the 3D printed version that I had saved, this, this file does not have the hole here. My guess is that what happened is Fusion 360 restarted before I saved it and I didn't open the recovery file. So that operation basically got lost. And when I made a copy of this file to create the aluminum version, it got lost as well. So I just added it back in and then I could redo the cam. The challenge here is that this is where, if I look at the coordinate system, this is where I was picking up the coordinates before. So I was picking up the back left or the back right faces here. Those faces don't exist anymore. And so what do I do? The answer is I can keep the coordinate system here and therefore set the rough location to there, but instead pick up these two faces here. These are known positions in the part. And so that will allow me to pick things back up and then mill this out in the center. I've set the approximate location of the probe to the back right and now it's running the cycle and you can see that it's moving to this feature that I've already milled. So it's going to pick up the right face of that feature and then it's going to move around to the back face of that feature. And now I can just go ahead and mill out the pocket. Now that I have the hole that I needed, I can install the four screws that hold the stepper motor in place. The, the holes are threaded in the brackets, so this is just a matter of uh, screwing in the screws. And then once I have have them all tightened, then it's time to put the pulley in place. And so the pulley has two set screws in each of those two holes. The inner one that actually holds it in place, and then outer set screw that locks the inner set screws in place. With the pulley locked in place, then I can put the belt in place, put it up against the rest of the assembly, get everything lined up, and then install the two screws. One is the pivot screw, which is the one I'm installing now, and then the other screw is going to be the screw that locks it in place at a specific angle, and that's something that I use to get the belt tension correct. Hmm. Something is not right. Looks like I uh, didn't get the calculations right. Uh, because uh, these are, there's a gap in here. Oh, that shouldn't be there. 
Okay, I, I looked at the CAD and I remember, and then took this back off and remembered that I have a hole in here for the shaft. So that means I need to move this down. And I believe that's about where I want it. So there's a enough a gap here so this can move freely. And then this is what's going to project into there. So let me put these outer set screws back in, hoping that I have this correct now. But it still doesn't fit correctly because you can see that I made this a circular hole, but I have this here so that I can adjust it for belt tensioning. So when this is in the one position, you can see it can't move very much. And so I made another mistake here, which is this needs to be a slot, uh, similar to this slot. So I'm gonna to have to take this off and modify this as well. After modifying that uh, bracket, the back bracket, to have a slot in it, I reinstalled everything, tightened up the belt. The, the belt is, has good tension now, and this is rock solid. If you see anything wiggling, it's because the whole table is moving, or the cart that it's on top of, not the stepper itself. So this is super rigid. And if I run this, you can see that this doesn't move at all. It's rock solid. So that's exactly what I was hoping. This turned out really well. I really like the finish on these parts, and so I'm super happy with the results. Even though I made a few mistakes, the results are perfect. I'm really happy with them. Well, maybe they're not perfect, but I'm happy. That's what matters. The mismatch between the top and the bottom is ever so slight, and I can see it if I look for it, but if I'm not looking for it, I probably wouldn't notice it. So I'm quite happy with how that turned out. Additionally, the vibratory tumbler works really well. It does take a long time because the media that I have, the smaller media, is not very aggressive. But the end result is really nice and it's resistant to fingerprints, which is the important thing. So I'm definitely going to do the vibratory tumbler again for future parts. I'm also definitely going to do the two-sided milling where I don't use a hat because for a lot of cases, it's going to make more efficient use of the material. And I'm very happy with the results. It's not something where I can really see it, as I said, unless I look carefully. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please give me a thumbs up, comment below, and subscribe. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.